Hello, and welcome to Wannabe. Today, we're joined by Hélène Guillaume, the CEO and founder of Wild.ai. We'll dive into her multifaceted journey of tackling the barriers in women's health and sports. From synchronized swimming and ultra marathons to balancing work and motherhood, Hélène is revolutionizing the way we think about women's health. In this episode, you'll get to hear why she's fighting against the under-researched state of women's health and the audacity that led her to go on stage with her baby. If you've ever felt the system was stacked against you, you won't want to miss Ellen's revolutionary approach to leveling the playing field. So sit tight and let's dive right into this soul-stirring conversation. Who did you want to be before you became who you are today and why? <laughs> Tough question. Um, I don't think I want to be someone specific or looking towards someone, but I definitely wanted to uh, get towards and living my personal legend, which is uh, in the book, The Alchemist. He defines it as you are following what your inner purpose is pushing you towards. And so I think being able to yeah, live fully and wake up in the morning and live in a way that fulfills me on a day-to-day basis because I believe in what you do every day makes your life uh, is something that really drives me. So I think I've been working towards that as opposed to really towards a person. Your background is actually incredibly varied from how you grew up. Uh, your family's background is quite diverse, like very diverse, actually. Um, you have lived in many, many places. And then there's also like, the, we'll get to like all of the sports you're involved with and like the extremes that you put your body through. But this kind of, I guess, quite wild, uh, pun unintended, uh, diversity has really kind of, how has that contributed to what you've built today with wild.ai? Yeah, I think I always questioned things around me so how I live what is what I can uh, the way I perceive myself and evolving in different uh, environments so when I was two years old we moved to Japan and so like you know like changing entirely the setting around what who I, who I meet how I live languages I speak and then again when I was four or five years old back to Europe so yeah I've been questioning things a lot since early on and I think that really put me on the path of questioning things like uh, how I perceive myself as a girl and then as a woman. I found it really hard when growing up hearing things like they're complicated and I was in sports and we are less interesting, less fast, less strong and the holy grail is this body that is a male. And uh, and I think that led me to, to build this company, which is how can I, as a woman, appreciate the fact that my body is incredible i would love to touch on your interest in sports so you mentioned that you you were quite sporty early on and now you do things like ultra marathons which just the thought of it scares me um you ice ice swimming also terrifying as a prospect uh, and you also surf so these are not like these are not small things (laughs) what what pushes you or what kind of got you into quote unquote these kind of more extreme sports and would you describe them yourself as extreme in any way i definitely would describe them as extreme because i think like i think one of the hardest thing i've done is is 100 kilometers ultra marathons and uh it is putting the body through levels that i've never experienced before what led me into that actually i just felt it was fun um some people go (laughs) in 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 that from like a, a place of, of pain mm-hmm. and they try to solve or numb their bodies through like ultra sports. I came from a place of, I can do it. So, I mean, I maybe I can do it. So I'm going to try it. I mean, doing an ultra in, in those conditions is, I think the human experience is so incredible. Like, you know, we were um, on this, you know, like that one of those was in in um, Vietnam. It's like really hot. Uh, you carry on your your own water, and I remember the time where I was run, I ran out of water, and there's a person who I who was also in the race and gave me some water, but it means they have less yes. water themselves. Yeah. And so it's this exchange of human experience, which yeah, just I've never lived in other places. Uh, so I find that really beautiful, and it is really extreme because. I mean, yeah, you have to, it obviously is physical, but the mental aspect of it is so strong. Like when you go through stages, like 
why am I doing that to myself? It's like, it's completely why crazy. Why are you doing and, that to yourself? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I was like, because it's like going through these levels that are so incredible. And I remember there's, uh, there's you know, if you, if you look at some people doing these ultras who are barely walking and like really struggling, uh, if we were forced to do that, it would be torture. Mm-hmm. But the, re- the fact that we choose to do it, we choose the hard and we choose the pain, we get value out of it and we get like it's exhil- exhilarating and it's we feeling a purpose in life and that's i think that's what i felt and just this feeling of accomplishments and i think that, like everything in life is and for instance i also have a daughter now who's eight months old uh we had this conversation with my partner it's sometimes really really hard and and we're having like oh pregnancy was really hard it's like it is hard but i loved it but it's like it is like an ultra marathon. It's like it's really hard, but I chose it and I love it. So I think in like how we behave towards what we choose and like you know uh, sleep deprivation in par- early parenting and sleep deprivation in ultra marathon is if we choose it. My at- my attitude now is if I choose it, like I have to enjoy it. It doesn't mean I cannot complain and I cannot find it hard. Like when you are doing mm. these ultras, it is hard but we choose it. And I think it's a really good learning in life is, and I, in entrepreneurship as well is, it is hard, but I chose it. So can I embrace these hardships? How did you juggle like your work, the pregnancy and these like big ambitions and goals that you have? I think what is not often told as a story to us as women mm-hmm. is that it is hard. Like there is no there is no way around and we are discriminated and there are massive biases and you accumulate biases but then can we flip that and take that to our advantage and my belief is like when I was fundraising pregnant I was like oh my first of all I I had so much appreciation for women in general I was like oh my god because I could work from home and I could work remote so I would lie down in my bed and that's why I didn't have too much back pain for instance Mm -hmm. is because I could actually lie down during the day so it didn't put strain on my body but I was thinking these women who are commuting in the early days of the pregnancy which is horrible and no one has compassion because you cannot see it I lost a baby so you know like women going through like multiple pregnancies uh grief and no, no they don't tell anyone so they have to hold that onto themselves and then women who go towards the end of the pregnancy also working commuting in busy places i have so much appreciation for women i'm like oh my god women are god we are god we're creating humanity and while we are creating humanity we are meanwhile working creating our careers etc on the on the on the hardships i think it's like complaining you 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 absolutely have all the rights to complain and i think that's what i'm telling my partner i'm telling him you know it's not because i chose it that i don't i cannot complain <laughs> like let me complain like let me say it's hard because it is hard so yeah i think it's finding the right tribes and and having more women like you just out you know like publicly saying that you are pregnant having more women saying that i think it's so powerful for all of us something that um I actually found really fascinating. Actually, because I became pregnant, I had a Fitbit and it was tracking my period and fine. That that was a thing. Um, and then I got pregnant and it just doesn't, it just stopped. Like it, there was no button. There was nothing to be like, I am pregnant now. And it just kept tracking this period that just did not exist. And I was like, this is dumb. I know that you like, you've kind of evangelized actually quite well about like why women need to know more Um and have more information about themselves. But like, why is there just this dearth? Why do you think there's this dearth of information? And why are companies so slow, if not, like, why are they so slow to move on this? Like, I don't understand. What is the resistance? Is it because there's no data? Is it because we're kind of woefully under-researched? Like, what is the reason that this isn't more mainstream um, as a topic uh, when it comes to women's health, women's reproductive parts, and just like, the yeah just the basics of our body i think it actually honestly comes from uh like so deeply ingrained in us which and i think religion plays a big part yeah. like in christianity the woman is either a virgin she's so pure or she's a prostitute mary magdalena and there's nothing in between so appreciating sex appreciating um human contact etc it just doesn't exist so we don't do not have a figure that is the woman who is like strong and powerful and create she doesn't even create a baby with a man she's like creating a baby with nothing so she doesn't even have 
a sexual reproductive system uh, because it comes from nowhere and um, she's a shell basically it's been put in her but she doesn't have a this this creating function that is glorified that we should glorify doesn't exist in our cultures and that is like so deeply ingrained in what we what we think that there is actually no good reason to analyze and do research on this female body because it is like so um it's a shell it's like it's so vanilla and there is no there there are no layers of of deeper understanding and i think because of all these underlying things it has not been necessary or interesting and then if you look at companies the way we are structured data scientists so like the data creation level up to um the products etc they were very male oriented so uh, I'll give you a, an example that I like giving. So at the very beginning of my company, we were in, uh, in having a meeting, two women and two men. And we were saying, what data should we track as a company? And uh, the women, we said, we should track sex drive. And the guy said, why would we ch- track sex drive? It never changes. And we say, well, no, it changes all the time. And <laughs> so to give you that example, it's <laughs> such, it's, if it was a male company, it's a non-data. It doesn't exist. It doesn't change. It's not interesting. Um, so that is how many companies are, are, are formed. It's just they cannot have the creativity because it doesn't exist for them. Yeah. And I think, and that is why, like, what we're doing is is important today because it actually, um, like, we want to be. If you are working with women, we want to be everywhere. Yeah. Like, you are a woman, you use Wild AI. If you're a coach, you use Wild AI. If you are a coach, you can get upskilled with the Wild AI Academy. Um, if you are a wearable, you use a plugin and you can serve women. Uh, because as you were saying, like the Fitbit, and it's a very good example. Now, two, three years ago, Apple added like the the, tra- the peer tracker, but you don't serve women by having peer tracker mm-hmm. because they don't have a period. They have a period. They use a contraceptive. We cover 149 contraceptives. They're all different. Yeah, the experience of just just menstruation <laughs> and and the things that that does to you, your body. And like the just the yeah the cycle of it all is insane. Just like just the changes of me as an individual, let alone do, like trying to track that on mass scale, must be insane. But actually, is so vitally important and necessary. Um, not just from the perspective of trying to get pregnant or not get pregnant. Just like how do I function and am I am I at my best? Um, just knowing that information is so so essential because actually I think uh and I'm sure you see this as well and you know this as well is that when we don't know things we blame ourselves or like the lack of information is it it creates self-blame or doubt and then that shame and stigma on top means that you just don't talk about it knowing that information really can make a difference to how you then go like what decisions you choose to make for the day and whether you take a supplement or whether you drink something else or you drink more water like I don't know like the the things that you can do to change but without that information we just don't know so we just blame ourselves and think I am fundamentally broken or I'm I'm not okay or this is just a me thing and it becomes a really internalized issue what we see as a feedback in people using while they eyes an app is they have multiple levels of appreciation of it the first thing is we give visibility on what might happen to your body and just that even if it doesn't happen because it's knowledge giving access to this knowledge as you were saying knowledge is power the fact that you might have some information and i mean for women is so obvious but the way i compare it to uh, for men is if you are waiting for the bus and you have no idea if it's going to arrive in five minutes or in 35 minutes like you might actually change your decisions mm-hmm. if it's going to arrive in five minutes or in five minutes. As women, we have no idea what's happening. We have no idea if I am ovulating and going to feel strong, if I am going to be a few days before and not feel strong because I don't know how it correlates. Yeah. I don't know when I'm going to have my perimenopause. I'm going to, I don't know what kind of symptoms I'm going to have. Is it going to impact me very heavily or not? I don't know if I'm fertile. I don't know how old I can have a baby until because we are called geriatric pregnancies when we're 45 yes. years old. Does it mean it's like I'm way too old to have a baby? Is it super scary? Like, do I have to freeze my eggs? Yeah. Is it really taxing on my body? So we have no, no idea. We operate completely in a world where we have no idea. And so the first thing is we give access to information and women are like, oh my God, finally someone is caring about it. Women, just by tracking things, they have realization sort of things. You, you experience with Fitbits, the fact that you start tracking, for instance, your sleep. Am I sleeping well or not? I know that I'm performing less well the day after if I had one or two glasses of wine. I'm just 
it's just not that important for me to do it. So I'll do it, but I'll do it less often, earlier in the night, etc. So I change my behavior. So tracking actually helps me understand certain things that I've never thought were things that I could pay attention to. And the third thing is actually like uh, following the recommendations that we provide in the app and and uh, and having that. So the impact on the world is really big because we give confidence to women that's what first of all we validate them like what you're feeling is we validate it and you know from the very first at the beginning of our conversation we're saying like when it's hard i want to be validated yeah i don't want to be like brushed away which is really often the case when we go to very doctors often. and like and especially as black women yeah. um you are told like oh no it's not valid like what you're feeling is not valid it doesn't exist and you're like i'm pretty sure it is but that's what we've been hearing as as little girls like you have period pain it doesn't exist yeah, it it's doesn't normal matter. you have a period yeah. it doesn't matter and you're like, well, then I'm not validated. So it, can I trust myself? Mm-hmm. And then so we, we validate you. We give you knowledge that it's, this is a thing that may happen. And so women are really grateful for that because they're like, oh, finally, I can start to understand. And then really the end goal is that we want to give women of all ages, life stages and ethnicities the tool and power to perform. And what it means for us is that if you have negative symptoms, they can disappear. They can go down. What you're building doesn't just impact sport, obviously. Like it's, this has the ability to talk about, like for women to really change their workforce or their workplaces. So yeah, I think I, I really, really have a tremendous respect and value for, uh, and really value what you're doing, what you're building. I think it's incredible. Um, and I can't wait to see it go from strength to strength and become more and more like, yeah, just a bigger part of the conversation. I would love to know, where do you get your audacity from? What makes you so audacious? I think it came from different places at different times. Um, I like one sentence I love, and I, I we made some rules when we were much younger with uh, Julia, my best friend. And one sentence that I really love is always jump. So you know when you have water and you're like you know when you like you haven't gotten the water yet, it's like oh, should I go in? <laughs> it's cold. It's the morning, and my thinking is like always jump. What are you working on getting better at right now? I think like one thing I really work towards now is um, getting back to a place where I have a child, but it's an, it's a very big new element in my life. And I don't have the equation rolled out yet on how I can have this other element in my life that is so important, which mm-hmm. is getting physical gratification out of sports. Yeah. Uh, so that is something I'm working on now. And I, I don't know, like, with my partner, it was like quite hard. Like, you know, surfing takes a lot of hours. So we don't have these this routine yet yeah. so what i'm working on now is how can i find this um complementary set and this equation that works for us for me and for us well thank you for sharing that that feels very honest and very important um and something that i think a lot of us can relate to because it it might not be sports for a lot of mothers it could be just other hobbies or pursuits and it is really hard to not only like find the motivation but yeah like you say finding the time commitment and yeah navigating that post baby is really really challenging and then the final question is what is the best advice you've ever received and the worst advice you've ever received worst advice actually really interesting i've had people commenting on uh, on me and it's people i really trusted and they were saying things that actually i took uh, as true so for instance you're the worst product manager i've ever met and it's it's a person I really trusted, and it really impacted my um, self worth. The advice, out of it was like you have to outsource that, which which by the way was not untrue. But the way the thing that was I think really hard is that I, I paid attention to this uh, input as if it was the absolute truth, mm-hmm. instead of protecting myself and not being able to be attained by the negativity of someone else and the perception. And I think that as entrepreneurs, as people evolving, and especially as people who are discriminated, like I'm a woman, you are a black, a black woman. It's like we have so many layers of discrimination, pregnant, like a new baby, et cetera, et cetera. That when we hear the thoughts of other people, I find it very difficult often to say they actually don't have all the elements to understand what I'm doing right now and that what I, I want to do and what I'm capable of. So yeah, I think that like to, to reply to your question, I think it's being able to separate the thoughts of a, of someone I I value their opinion of 
uh, and just thinking they actually are not right. They don't know. And you know, we know that in in parent uh, in parenting, people are like they need to sleep on the front, they need to sleep on the back. Yeah. They actually don't know. So the way I'm trying to go around advice of people is really follow my gut instinct. Mm -hmm. Like, how does it feel really in my body? How do, like do I feel a bit like? pants in my throat and if it feels on not right how can i follow better my instinct on the positive advice um i think it's uh like creating you know like you're creating a podcast now i think we're very good consumers especially in our generation one of the best advice would be create because there is an audience there are some people you know you read this article of me pregnant it resonated when i was pregnant uh and i, I, I wanted to talk to founders who had fundraised it was so important to me. I didn't want to generate information online or like yeah. how to be a founder. I wanted to talk to people because it's so important to have this like, to ask this very specific question that I had. So yeah, creating content, I think is like whoever you are, wherever you are. And even if you have one person reading it, who's your mom, yeah. your mom <laughs> is like, it's like, it's enough. It's like, it's great. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much, Ellen. Oh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. And that's a wrap. If you know someone that would benefit from the knowledge and wisdom shared in this episode, please do share it with them now. To keep up with Wannabe, follow us along on your favourite podcast player or app or follow at Content is Queen HQ on Instagram for the latest updates and episode releases. Until next time, bye.